Well, good morning. Welcome to New Life Church. My name is Brett Lilly. How you guys doing? Whoo, man, what a great Sunday to be here. It is Palm Sunday, and if you are new with us this morning, I want to welcome you. You picked an incredible Sunday to join us. Hopefully, wherever you're at, the sun is shining and God's glory is being seen. And that is the reason that we gather here together on Sundays to glorify God. As we look at our world today, we can see his glory in every situation that we're in, including the one we're in right now. As we've talked about, this is a new normal for a time being, which is strange. It's a little bit different, but it's what we've been given and we're gonna make the most of it because God is still at work. And so today we're wrapping up our third message in a three-part series that we've been calling, Where Are You? We've been asking the question through these three weeks, where are you, as an opportunity to take a personal inventory and ask that question of ourselves, where are we? We talk about personally, where are we personally? We've talked about spiritually, where are we spiritually? And today we're asking the question, God, where are you? Where are you, God? As we get into that, I wanna ask you guys a question. So go ahead, pull out your phone, the last couple of questions that we've asked, we were close to the 100 number. We hit 83 on our last one. So I'm going to ask you this question, our third and final question this morning. And that question is this, are your best days on this earth behind you, in front of you, or right now? Are your best days on this earth behind you, in front of you, or right now? As you're answering that question, I would love to be in your living room hearing how you came to that conclusion. What's going on inside your mind? How did you determine that? There's a good chance that you compared and contrasted situations to get to that decision. That you looked at something that happened behind you and compared it to the current moment you're in. Or you looked at something in front of you and compared it to something behind you or this moment, or you looked at this moment and compared it to something behind you or in front of you, and you made the decision that your best days are either now, in front of you, or behind you. See, we as individuals, as humans, have a tendency to do that. We compare and contrast. My wife and I, when we were first married, had an opportunity to live in California. We were taken out there through a number of situations and circumstances, and so as young marrieds with no kids, we were in California. It was an incredible place to be. We got connected to a church. We had a small group that we were, that we were a part of. We had 13 couples that we would hang out with as we were trying to figure out life. One of the things we figured out in that time is this, that the best way to figure out life is to do it together that we did life together. There were all sorts of activities that we had a chance to participate in. One of our favorite activities was this, camping. We loved to camp. And so every year we'd take an annual trip. We were out there for a number of years and we would take an annual trip. One of them being to this place right here, Yosemite. It's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. If you've never been there, put it on your bucket list. You have to go. El Capitan, Half Dome, all the beautiful waterfalls. And we would camp right here in the valley. Right here in the valley was a river that would run through it. Cold water coming from the mountains, snow melts. We would tube on the river. We'd set up tents. We would stay in cabins. We had these, I think they're called yurts. I'm not sure. But we would stay wherever we possibly could. And it was fantastic. Another place that was a favorite of ours was Big Sur. South of San Jose, you drive down. San Jose was where we lived. You drive down along the coast and you could be on the ocean. You had all the trees. It was one of the best times in our lives. We loved it. And you couldn't beat being there as a young Mary with no kids. We were able to do all sorts of activities. We hung out with our friends like three times a week. We'd cook for each other. We'd go to restaurants when that was still possible. We'd go to movies. We would bike. We would hike. We had inside jokes. There were things that we would talk to each other about where something was said and you could look at the other person and you wouldn't even have to say anything and you'd burst into laughter because you both knew exactly what the other was thinking. It was a time in my life that I'll never forget. And then circumstances took us apart. 
People moved away. Others had kids. We were brought to the Midwest. And yet those times implanted in my brain memories that I will never forget and connections that I will never lose. One of the things that I've done in my life is since then is I've had the tendency to compare everything that I've done in life to that moment, to that place. Well, having lived in Illinois and now Minnesota, they don't quite compare to the outdoor life that that location did in San Jose. We had Tahoe not too far, we had the beach, we had it all. Friendships, friendships I've had. I've compared two different friendships throughout, including that group that I was a part of in California. And here's what happens when we compare and contrast. We have a tendency to add a positive or negative value to something when we compare it to another. We have a tendency to add a positive or negative value to something when we compare it to another. When I asked you, where are your best days? You probably compared it to something and then added a value to it. Was it negative? Was it positive? What was it? See, many of us right now are doing that in the situation that we're in. I've talked to a number of people that have added a value to where they're at. And for the most part, that value has been negative. That the current environment that we live in is not positive. That it's overly negative and we've been putting a value on it. But should we do that? Is it good? Is it bad? Or is it different? Because when we put a value, a negative value specifically on something, it causes us to start asking questions. Questions like, why is this happening? Why do I have to go through this? When will this end? When will we get relief? When will it go back to normal? But what if it never does? And what if what we're experiencing now becomes the new normal? Is it positive? Is it negative? Or is it different? As we put a negative value on something then, it walks us down the path where as we continue to ask questions, it can lead to places that we don't wanna go. It can lead to depression. It can lead to anxiety. It can lead to sadness. And then ultimately, it can lead to questioning. Questioning God. Asking the ultimate question, God, where are you? I've heard from many people in this time that exact question, where are you, God? And that's the question that I want to answer today. So open with me this morning to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. If you don't have a Bible, I'd love to give you one. You can go ahead and follow along on any device. We use the Bible app. You can download one on any smart device that you may have with you. It's brown. It's got yellow letters. It says Holy Bible. In there, if you go into other or extras or more, you can go into events. And we have our event live right now where you can click on that event and you will see all the slides that I'm using this morning and you can follow along with me there. Or I'll send you one. If you don't have a hard copy of one and you want one, reach out to me. I will get it to you. Or you may know somebody that wants one, needs one. I will get them one as well. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 8 to begin, and we're going to actually compare and contrast two stories this morning. And so I want to begin with this story, Matthew 8. It's the story of Jesus as he was talking to a number of people on the shoreline. And it's a familiar story for many of us, but the context is he'd just been with a large crowd and he needs to get away. It's time for him to remove himself. And so he takes his disciples, he gets in a boat, and he's about to cross the lake to the other side. And then this happens. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus was probably on a shoreline much like this. This is a picture of the Sea of Galilee. 
a picture of a place where there's a hill in the background where he may have been preaching as he stood on the shoreline. The crowds were there with him, wanting to hear him. And in order for him to get away, he had to get into a boat. Now, he had called a bunch of fishermen to be his disciples, and so they probably had a boat readily available. So he gets into the boat, and he crosses the sea to get to the other side, to get a little distance. But then this story takes place while they're on the sea, and it's a pretty great story. It's a story that is very well known. It's a story that we may resonate with in this time, and it's a story that each one of us, one of us would say, I get it. But how do we know it's a great story? Well, let's analyze its parts. It's known, fairly well known in literature, that there are five main parts to a great story. And those parts are these, the setting, the people, the problem, the experience or the point of view, the outcome or the moral. Setting, people, problem, experience, and outcome. So to see whether this truly is a great story, let's look at those five elements for this particular tale. What was the setting? Well, the setting was a lake. They were on the lake. The people were Jesus and his disciples. The problem was it was a big storm. The experience was fear and trepidation. And the outcome was that Jesus calms the wind and the waves and the disciples stand in awe. As we analyze those five points, we can see that this story has each one of those. So we can rightly say this was a great story. And I can say that within my own experience in my own life because this story recently has truly impacted me. See, when everything happened with COVID-19, when all of the world shut down, we happened to be on a beach standing looking at a large body of water. And this story connected with me because I watched the wind in the waves. I was experiencing it in real time. I can't control the wind and the waves. I stood there. I couldn't even make my way through the waves without getting knocked over half the time. And yet this story, as I was standing there, said that Jesus stood up in the middle of the boat with wind and waves and calmed them and immediately was still. Oh, don't think I didn't try. I sat there with all my might and power and went, stop. And they didn't. They kept going. They kept rolling. I kept playing in them. In fact, I rode a couple of them with my kids and taught them how to boogie board. It was a lot of fun. And yet I stood in awe as this story came to mind as I was watching the wind and waves going, this man named Jesus can calm this. He could stand here right now and say, be still. And I know that because he's done it. But not only was that story going through my mind, but this happened to be the pillow that was in the room that we stayed in. Even the waves obey his voice. See, I don't think it was a mistake that as everything was getting topsy-turvy and the world was becoming unsettled, and it felt like the boat was shaking back and forth. That God gave me the opportunity to stand on the beach to remember this story and to have this in the bedroom that I was staying in. What a great story. So now I want to compare that story with another one. And what story is that? Well, that story is our story the story that we're living right now. So how do they compare? Well, let's go back to those five components, the five components of a great story. First, the setting. So the setting of this story was on a lake. Ours is the land of lakes, or at least where we're streaming from is in the land of lakes. The people, their story was about Jesus and his disciples. Our story is about Jesus and his disciples. If you haven't figured that out, you and I, if you believe in Jesus Christ, are his disciples. Their problem was a literal storm. Our problem is a cultural storm. Their experience was one of fear and trepidation. And for many of us, our experience right now is a fear and trepidation. And then the outcome, Jesus calms the wind and the waves and the disciples stand in awe. Our outcome, still to be determined. So as we compare and contrast those stories, which story is better? Which story right now, if you had to choose, would you put a positive value on and say, this story is better? If I had to choose, 
I'd choose the first one. I'd choose the story of Jesus with his disciples on the lake. Why? Because I know the outcome. I can give it a positive or negative outcome. I can say it's good or bad because I know what took place. And we so desperately want that. As I look at our current story right here, right now, I want to know the end. I want to know what happens so I can answer the question I asked at the beginning of the service. Where are my best days? I want to know how this takes place, how this transpires, so I can put a positive or negative value on it. I want to know the outcome. In the first story, we know Jesus calmed the storm. In our story, we don't know how the storm ends. And yet, in the middle of this story, Matthew is giving us something that we can hold on to in this time. In fact, the theme that Matthew is pointing out in this story can help us immensely today because I believe it's a major theme in what God is doing in our lives. And he shows us that theme with these simple words. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Oh, you of little faith. See, the major storyline in this story is faith. The major theme in this story that Matthew shows us is faith. The faith the disciples didn't have, Jesus was building in them in this moment. And I think it's safe to say that a major theme in our lives right now that probably resonates with you is that Jesus is doing the same thing to us. That in the middle of our storm, could it be that God is building our faith the the way he was building the disciples at that time? Does your faith need to be built? I know mine does. See, I have faith. I have faith in a lot of things. I have faith in this stool. If I were to bring this stool out and I were to sit on it like this, I have faith that it's going to hold me up. See, we put our faith in things every day. Sitting down in this chair or this live stream, I have faith right now that you're seeing me. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm assuming if you couldn't see me, my tech guys would yell at me and say, hey, we're done, stop, they can't see you anymore. But I can't see you. I'm putting my faith in the fact that what I'm saying right now is going to be transmitted across a bunch of wires and satellites and airwaves and all sorts of other things. And then it's going to get to you and you're going to be able to hear this message. We have a lot of faith in a lot of things. But is it, t- is it possible at times that we put our faith in the wrong things? See, We've put our faith in things in this life. We've put our faith in things regularly that we don't even realize, I think. And yet this has been a time, a storm that has come through that has taken those things that we have put our faith in and gone, whoo, and shaken it. Things like money, possessions, status, position, friends family, all things in our lives right now that if I were sitting with you in your living room, we could check all of those and go, how much security do we have in them right now? How much faith do I have that they will carry me through? Some of them would be stronger. I have a lot of faith in my family, and yet in this time, one of the crazy things that's happening is because of the situation we're in, I can't see them. And my parents, as they get older, there are things they're dealing with to where they fall into a high-risk category to where my mom has been told that she can't see her grandkids for three months. Money. The stock market has all of a sudden just gone kablooey in those 401ks that we were standing on as that firm foundation. If I can just get a million dollars in there, I'll be fine. Our houses, our cars, everything has been shaken. We're in the middle of a storm. And that may be the case for you today in a very serious way. 
Maybe the things that you've put your faith in are being shaken. Maybe you feel like you're being tossed about on the sea like a boat. You feel like Jesus is asleep. He's in your life. He's a regular part of what you do. You get up every morning. You have a quiet time. You pray. You know he's there. And yet you feel like he's asleep. The motion is too much. The feelings are overwhelming and the storm is bearing down on you. Or maybe the storm is all around you. It's easy in this time then to feel like Jesus doesn't care. I think the disciples felt that way. Why is he sleeping? Why isn't he doing something? Why aren't you active right now? Why aren't you visibly present? Why haven't you taken care of this? Do you feel that way? I know I have. And it's like this, like one moment I'm here, one moment I'm here, one moment I'm here. We talked about the mountains and the valleys and everywhere, and and it just hasn't subsided yet. And so the idea of the waves rolling and the boat being there and being on the boat and seeing Jesus in front of me going, hey, do you not get it? Do you not understand? Like something's going on around me right now. Could you take care of this, please? I'm kind of freaking out. Which is why I love the first story more than I love my story because I know the outcome of that story. I don't know how mine ends yet. I just want to get there. I just want to be done with this. And yet as we look at this story, the first story, we look back at their story, we see the arc of the story, we see the tension point with the storm, and we see the outcome. We see the resolution. Jesus stands up, he calms the wind and the waves, and the disciples are safe. It is you read the story, did you notice the point in the story where the resolution actually took place? See, the resolution in the story wasn't when Jesus stood up and calmed the waves. It wasn't when the disciples felt safe. It was actually prior to that. And it came at a very simple point with these words. Then he got into the boat. Then he got into the boat. You see, the story wasn't resolved when he calmed the storm. But rather, the story was resolved when he stepped into the boat. At that moment was when it was over. The story was done. The culmination had already occurred. Jesus was in their boat. So why weren't they doing what he was doing? Why weren't they asleep? Why weren't they watching him as the example? Why weren't they taking their cues from him? Instead of worrying and staring at the storm, they should have been looking at Jesus, who was right there with them. Yeah, they hadn't known what he was going to do. They didn't know the outcome. This was building their faith. And we can easily, on the outside of it, look back at that story and go, hey, why didn't you get it? Which is fantastic, because that's exactly what we should be saying to ourselves today. Hey, why are you looking at the storm? Why are you looking outside the boat? Don't you know that Jesus is right there? Maybe we should follow cues from him. Anybody notice him freaking out yet? Anybody notice him doing anything crazy? I'm not going to lie. I was at a point this week where I had gone over the top. I was at my tipping point. I had gone to the beyond. And I had to come back. I had to reel myself back in. I actually had to have many people around me go, okay, man, whoo, settle down. Stop looking at the storm. Because it's so easy for us to do that, to see the clouds billowing in, to see the waves crashing, to see everything happening for us to focus our attention there. And yet this story shows us, the disciples are teaching us that instead of looking at the storm, we need to see Jesus. And yet they didn't see it that way just yet. Why? Because there was still growing and maturing that needed to happen. Specifically, in growing and maturing their faith. That storm had to happen so they would stand in awe of who Jesus was and what he was doing. And I think the same is happening with us today. This storm that we're in is exactly what needs to take place to continue to build our faith. 
It would have been so easy for the disciples to compare that situation to another, to look and say, oh, I wish I had not gotten on the boat, or to say, hey, maybe if we get to shore, we will be safe, to look behind them or to look ahead of them, and yet the thing they needed to do was to be in that exact moment, which is exactly where God wants us right now, right here in this moment. At the beginning of this message, I asked the question, where are your best days 57% of you said in front of you. 35% said right now. 8% said behind you. 57% of us are looking outside of our boat. I'm one of those individuals. Where are my best days in front of us? I've been looking behind me, and yet what I want to challenge and what I want to encourage right now is that maybe it's something a little bit different. Maybe it's the fact that right now are our best days because God is building our faith. And you know what? He doesn't want much. In fact, he wants a very little. He says this to his apostles. They said in Luke chapter 17, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And he replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. The disciples wanted their faith to be increased. And he said, all you need is the faith of a mustard seed, a very small amount. Yet what does it take to grow our faith? What does it take to get that amount of faith? Sometimes it takes storms. Sometimes it takes situations just like we're in right now for the purpose of growing our faith. So how does our faith grow? Three things. First, faith is a gift from God. It's given to us. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. God has given us faith. Through his grace, he has given us faith. It is a gift. He gives it freely to each and every one of us. This time that we are in right now may be God's gift of faith. It may be for some of you watching today that you've never put your faith in Jesus, that this is the time that you are checking out churches, that you are looking for answers. This storm may be a gift, a gift to grow your faith. Second, it comes from hearing the word. We give away a Bible every Sunday. We study God's word every Sunday because faith grows by studying God's word, Romans 10, 17. Consequently, the faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. The message of faith is heard through the word of Christ. We must be individuals that continue to listen to the message, that be in God's word, that hear from him daily, commune with him. And third, faith grows by including action. James 2.17, in the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied. It, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. See, we can't just sit still in our time. Our faith grows when we put it into action. But action is different for all of us. For some of us right now, it means running into the face of danger for our medical personnel, for our first responders. As we said last week, I want to thank you again for what it is that you're doing. For some of us, faith means being on the front lines for people that are in shelters, for people that are doing ministry hands on with people that have no place to go as they're sheltering in place with individuals that are at risk for individuals in nursing homes. The list goes on and on and on of all the people. Your faith is being tested right now and your faith is being put into action. Thank you. I have seen story after story after story of individuals, their faith is growing. God is pushing them. God is challenging them in this time as they act out what it is that they believe. For some of us, faith means being more present on social media. Maybe it's vocalizing what it is that you believe for the very first time. Or maybe it's liking somebody else's post. Somebody that's putting themselves out there saying, hey God, I'm calling out to you. Are we encouraging each other that way? Maybe faith means sharing things. It's one thing to consume on social media. It's a whole nother thing to share. Are we sharing our faith? Is God growing it? When I see a post that has to do with him and his name, when Jesus is at the center of it, what do I do? Do I click on it? Do I share it? Do I put it out there? Or am I nervous about it because I might wonder what people are gonna think? Maybe God's growing our faith through being more present on social media. Or maybe God's growing our faith by telling us just to stay home. Just stay home. 
For me, that's a huge faith builder. Living in this time, in this perfect storm, our faith is being built. But the beautiful thing about this season of faith building is that it's teaching us this, that Jesus has already determined the end of this. And it isn't when these circumstances that we are in subside, but rather it was when Jesus stepped into our lives. So as you compare the two stories, they're almost exactly the same. There was a storm that Jesus was physically in. There's a storm that we are currently in. Jesus calmed the wind and the waves in that storm. And if the resolution of that storm was when he stepped into the boat. Jesus will calm the storm that you're in. But it's not when the circumstances subside. But the resolution to this storm was when he stepped into your life. And so I would be remiss at this point if I didn't ask you this question. Do you know that Jesus is in your boat? Do you know that he's there with you? Maybe you don't. Maybe for the first time you're watching this going, I need answers. Well, I have the answer for you and his name is Jesus. The disciples stood in awe of him and said, who is this man? Even the wind and waves obey him. He calms storms. They don't overwhelm him because he's in control of them. Jesus can calm your storm. The Bible tells us that if we believe in our heart and proclaim with our mouth, that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. So maybe where you're at right now, for the very first time in your living room, you need to believe in your heart and proclaim with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Don't wait. Now's the time. Because Jesus is resolving this storm. And we know the end. What is the end? The same as the disciples. We will stand in awe and say that he even controls this storm. Which brings us to answer the question we asked at the beginning of this message. Where are you, God? Where are you? And the answer, he's still in the same place he was before. He's asleep on the boat. Right there with us fully in control. Building our faith. Which is exactly what he did for his disciples, which is exactly what he's doing right now. Want to know why I know that? Because that's what he's doing to me. He's building my faith in a way that I don't know if I've ever experienced. Which is what he did for the disciples. He was building their faith because this moment on the boat led them to continue to follow him. They answered the call, come follow me. They gave up everything. They went after him. And they stood in awe of him in this story and they, they followed him. And they watched him on Palm Sunday be ushered in. Hosanna in the highest. He was celebrated as king. They ate with him one last time. They entered Holy Week following after him, knowing who he was, and yet it all changed. He was betrayed. He was turned over. He was crucified. And yet we know how the story ends. He then conquered death. And when he appeared again to his disciples, these same men that stood in the boat and stood in awe of him, followed him all the way to the end. And they changed our lives and the world we live in today because of the message they carried. And that message was the message of Jesus. See, God is growing our faith in this season. I truly believe he is because he wants us to do the same. No matter what the cost, are we willing to give it up? Are we willing to answer the call? Are we willing to weather the storm? So at the end, we will stand in awe of him and proclaim his name like never before. 
So this Holy Week, let's keep our eyes on Jesus and not the storm. Let's look at him and know that he is still in control and celebrate the fact that he is in our boat. He has our lives and he has his plan still firmly in his grasp. So to finish this series, I wanna ask the question I started with, where are you? Where are you? The answer, right where you're supposed to be. Whatever you are going through right now, God is using for his purpose, all of it. He's stretching your faith and growing you to be used by him for his glory because that's what he's doing to me. So I wanna finish with a poem that I came across a couple weeks ago that says this. I was, reading, I was regretting the past and fearing the future. Suddenly my Lord was speaking, my name is I am. He paused, I waited. He continued, when you live in the past with its mistakes and its regrets, it is hard. I am not there. My name is not I was. When you live in the future with its problems and fears, it is hard. I am not there. My name is not I will be. When you live in this moment, it is not hard. I am here. My name is I am. Know that today you are right where you are supposed to be, that your best days are right now. Because if Jesus is in your boat, the storm is already calmed and he's gonna grow our faith and he's gonna push us forward and he's gonna use us for his glory so that when the world sees us, they will know that he is the I am. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you are a God that cares for us, that loves us, that knows us, that knows our situation right now. In this storm, you are there. And Lord, it might feel like you're asleep. And guess what? That is so cool. That is totally fine because you have it in control. You have it in your hands. You don't need to be up. You don't need to be active. You don't need to be doing anything because you've got this. And so Lord, I pray right now that we will be people that look at you instead of the storm. That we see you, that we take our cues from you, that we follow after you. In this moment, in every moment from here to come, that we will be like the disciples, that we will stand in awe. Who is this man? And that we will be people that say, Lord, I believe. And we continue to follow. We thank you so much for who you are, Jesus. We give everything to you. It's your name we pray. Amen.